Dr. Anush Daftari. I'm going to be speaking today about osteoporosis and spinal fractures. We'll go through a few treatment options as well. Uh, you'll also hear about kyphoplasty. Uh, I have nothing to disclose financially. So for the agenda, um, so we'll talk, about the osteo uh, we'll talk about osteoporosis, the epidemiology, risk factors, what are the, common compli what are the complications of osteoporosis, um, and then with spinal fractures, like I said, with kyphoplasty, um, we'll see what is a kyphoplasty, how is it performed, who's an ideal candidate, what are the risks of the procedure, and how can, it help it, how can we help you if you do have a fracture in your spine. So to start with, what is osteoporosis? It's a disease of the skeletal system. The, the skeletal system is the, uh, the actual bones of our body. Mo the most of the times when we see a fracture, when it's related to osteoporosis, it involves the spine, the hip, and the wrist. Um, because these are the most common areas where a fracture occurs, when we talk about imaging a little bit later, you'll see that um, when they get bone scans or, or a DEXA scan to assess for uh, mineralization, these are the three common areas that the radiologist will look at to assess our risk factors for fracture. Um, osteopenia, I want everyone to understand what that also means. That's the precursor to osteoporosis. Uh, it basically means the bones are weaker than what we expect. However, they're not fragile enough to be diagnosed as osteoporosis. You can still have a fracture develop when you have osteopenia. Um, it doesn't mean that you're exempt from fractures at that point, but it is, it's not as weak as when you do have osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is defined as bone that, that has lost significant about, amount of bone minerals, mineral density and mass. So we've lost a lot of calcium and minerals in our bones. Um, and that has a higher risk of fragility fractures. So how do I develop osteoporosis? So as we're getting older, you know, once we hit our 20s, that's when we reach our peak bone mass. That's when we have the greatest amount of mineralization within our bones. They're the strongest, they're the, dense, they're the densest. Um, they have a lower chance of uh, fracturing. I mean, they can still fracture with injuries, but having a fragility fracture, such as when we get older, is less likely to happen, meaning because of the loss of bone mineralization there. The, what happens through our life is bone remodeling. So approximately every seven years and throughout that process, all our bone, the, the, minerals, the minerals within our bone is replaced, including the calcium. Um, with osteoporosis and osteopenia, usually what happens is more bone is lost, meaning it's more of it's replaced, and the bones become thinner, they become fragile, they're more brittle, and that's what leads to the uh, risk of breakage. So one way I like to explain things is, um, if you look at our, our home, when we move into our home, um, you know, we're, we're putting all this furniture and everything inside, and as we load our home up, there, it, there's a lot of stuff in there. That's where you know, we put a lot into our bones as well to make them stronger. Now, most of our homes will co start collecting things and they'll, we'll have too much eventually as we get older. But in terms of bones, they'll start losing that stuff. You'll start losing um, you know, your furniture. You'll start losing you know, other items within, our, within your home as well. Um, and it'll empty out eventually and becomes more, you know, well, with bones, it becomes more fragile. Our homes still will survive or um, so am I at risk of osteoporosis and developing a fracture? So this is some epi epidemiologic data. So around the world annually, there's approximately 8.9 million osteoporotic fractures. That's approximately one fracture every three seconds. One in three women and one in five men over the age of 50 will experience an osteoporotic fracture. A woman who's 65 years of age with one vertebral body fracture uh, will um, has one in four chance of another fracture over five years, which can be reduced to one in eight if, they're, if it's properly treated. Every 22 seconds, there's a new vertebral body compression fracture. So just to go back, so uh, ev there's a fracture a with the involving, it could be the hip, the wrist, it could be anywhere, um, the spine, every three seconds. How when it comes to the uh, spine itself, just looking at that one area, uh, there's a fracture every two s 22 seconds. The number of people at high risk of fracture is expected to double between 2010 and 2040. So right, you know, at 2010 when they look at the data is approximately 158 million they um, are at risk of a fracture. And the expectation is, a, uh, is that it's supposed to reach to about 319 million people uh, and we're looking at this around the world. So what are my risk factors and what can I control? 
Um, so some of the things that are under your control is your alcohol consumption, smoking, your body mass index. You know, having a low body mass index will increase your risk. Smoking will increase your risk. Alcohol will increase your risk. If you don't have proper nutrition, if you have um, reduced vitamin D levels, so that you should always ask your primary care doctor to get that tested to make sure that you're within normal range. Eating disorders, such as anorexia or bulimia or, or, or something else. Uh, physical inactivity, a sedentary lifestyle, insufficient exercise. You know, those will all lead to increased risk of fracture as well as we get older. Uh, low dietary calcium intake, frequent falls will also increase that risk. And there are also factors that we cannot control. Um, there's a higher rate of fractures in the Caucasian and Asian population. Uh, family history of osteoporosis also puts you in that direction. Uh, if you're female, you're, you're a higher risk than if you were a male. If you're postmenopausal, if you have um, impaired neuromuscular function, neuromuscular means issues with your muscles and, and the nerves, um, and there could be genetic causes for that. Uh, if you have a history of a previous fracture, uh, unfortunately we can't control that either. Um, menopause, having a hysterectomy. If you've had a lot of steroid use for various reasons, it, it could be um, you know, from allergies or some sort of um, uh, immunologic disorder or you know, and there's, a, there's a number of reasons why you can end up on daily steroid use or, or maybe even just very, very frequent injections. Um, rheumatoid arthritis or having primary or secondary hypogonadism in men. And hypogonadism is because of how it affects our, our, our hormones in the body as well in men. So when we look at osteoporotic fractures, I mentioned this earlier, um, the place where we see majority of fractures are in the spine. 27% of them are usually end up in the spine. The wrist is approximately 19%, hip 14%, pelvis and other bones are approximately 33%. Sorry, pelvis is 7% and other bones are approximately 33%. So from here, I'm going to focus more on spine fractures. Um, there's a few different types of spine fractures. The, most, um, the picture on the left, on the top, shows a side view of a normal vertebral body, a normal spine bone. There are two, I'm going to break it up into two different parts. The front part is that big part of the bone, and then there's the back part of it as well, which has well, you can see on the wording itself there. And then on the bottom picture, just below on the bottom left, you again, you can see the colored area, which is the back part, which is, this is a top-down view. And then on the left side is again the front part, which is the main, the big, the big portion of the bone itself. Um, so this is again is the vertebral body. Um, when we look at the vertebral body, there's different types of fractures. The most common type of fracture is a wedge fracture. And that's what we see in the second picture. A wedge fracture is when um, the big bone, the front, it actually compresses down and it looks almost like a wedged pillow. The back part is still intact. There's no fracture through that area. So when we see a fracture in the front, and again, that's the most common type we see, we often talk, talk about various different types of treatment options from conservative to um, to interventional, which would include like a kyphoplasty um, or surgical, more often the first two. Um, when we look at the next picture, it's a chance fracture. Chance fracture is when the fracture actually went through both the back part of the bone all the way through into the front of the bone as well. Um, and there is a, a significant amount of instability at that point in that fracture, and usually with conservative management or um, even trying to cement the bone together is not going to be sufficient. Uh, with that instability, there can, you can lead to neurologic changes. You can have a lot more issues going on um, if it's not corrected. So many of these patients, or, or pretty much every patient with a chance fracture, will end up seeing a spine surgeon uh, uh, for stabilization. And usually it's more of a surgical intervention at that point. Burst fractures most of the times involve the front part, but many times can also involve the back part of the bone as well. So when it does involve the front and the back, or we see bony fragments that are protruding into the canal, um, many, that will end up as a surgical case again because the pressure along the nerve root many times needs to be released um, so that we don't end up with a, some, uh, a neurologic issue. Again, there's many times there's instability in these as well, and you can have additional problems which could lead to paralysis or, or um, you know, so. But um, 
Now, if the burst fracture is isolated only to the front, then there are times where we are able to treat it more conservatively, but it is also monitored more closely. So with vertebral compression fractures, what are the consequences? What actually happens when we, when we develop a fracture? And many times they depend on where the fracture happened. Um, when you look at the picture right on the right side of the screen, on the, the left side skeleton shows a person who is standing up straight. There's no fracture. Um, their bone mineralization is also intact. You can see they're showing the thickness of it. It's, it's nice and mineralized. On the right side of the screen, it shows a person who is bent forward. And when they're bending forward, it's because of a fracture. They likely have a, uh, a compression fracture in that area, that, that first fracture I showed you guys. Um, when that happens in the middle of the spine, the, 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 the mid-back can end up with something called a kyphotic curvature. Kyphotic curvature is when it bends a little bit this way. And you, it looks like you have a hump on your back. When that happens, your abdomen also starts protruding. Um, you see more of it. It can affect uh, several of the organs inside. You can feel um, when you're eating, you may get full a lot faster. You may start noticing weight, uh, weight loss. Uh, it can affect your lung function. Um, you can have some neurologic changes with this. Um, and because this is not you, this is not how you were before the fracture, many times people get depressed. Um, and that can also affect their, their lifestyle. When they're depressed, you stay in bed more. You're not, you know, you're not as, as social. Um, so it brings, uh, unfortunately, it brings a lot of other issues. Um, you can also have fear of activity because you're afraid that another fracture may happen. And I, I see this happen in my clinic often. I see patients coming in who do have a fracture and, and they're afraid that they're going to get another fracture. They're going to, something else is going to happen and they, they really change their lifestyle um, so that they can avoid these types of complications. Um, and when a fracture happens, many times, if it's not treated appropriately, meaning the osteoporosis is not treated appropriately, or you did not seek treatment, um, you can start seeing adjacent level fractures or fractures in other areas as well. So how will a compression fracture pain feel? So most patients who come to my clinic have significant tenderness right over the fracture site. So when I, when I start pushing on their back, whether it's their mid-back or their low back where we see the fracture, right in the middle over their spine is extremely or excruciating. It, it, it's tender. It can make you jump off your seat. I mean, they don't do that because they're in so much pain, but um, it's, it, it is it's severely painful. Majority of these patients do not have shooting pain. It's not radiating to their legs or off to the side uh, around their flank into their chest. It's really isolated to the back. You can feel a referred sensation of pain, meaning it's not localized right over that area. And sometimes you can feel it going to the, you may feel pain in the abdomen, flank, hip, groin, buttocks, thigh, legs, ribs. Fractures can do different things. So I, I have patients that come in, they have pain in the middle, and all of a sudden they'll tell me, well, I also have some pain in the hip that I never had before. And when we get x-rays, the hip looks fine outside, maybe some arthritic changes, and we see the fracture right in the middle uh, of the low back. Uh, and once we get that treated appropriately, all of a sudden the hip pain also goes away. So um, I'm not saying it's isolated the hip alone, it could be other areas as well, but um, it's, for all patients, it, the, the area that's most tender will be over the fracture site. When it is a new fracture or a recent fracture, like within the last few weeks or few months, um, once it becomes old or chronic, majority of people do not have pain from a fracture at that location. So what are the findings on physical exam? And we talked, about, we hit on this uh, a little bit earlier on a few of the things. Um, when you have a fracture, your mobility is going to change. You know, the way you're walking around, you may not be able to walk as fast. You may be, uh, I have had patients come in in a wheelchair uh, because of how severe it is. It, it's, it's just very disabling. Um, your posture will change. And that also depends on the location of the fracture. If it's in your middle of your back, you'll end up having a little bit of a hump. You'll be, your posture will be bent forward. Uh, if it's more in the low back, we may not see that as much. Um, there'll be tenderness at the fracture site. Um, you can develop hip flexure contractures. And what that means is because you ha you're leaning forward to take the pressure off the air, off the fracture site, your, your, your hips and your abdomen, your, your like you're leaning forward a little bit, and so if that happens for quite some time, your, your, your muscles get used to it, and, and they develop something, they develop tightness in there, or stiffness in those muscles. So it's hard to stand up straight because of how tight they are. And most of the times, majority of times, neurologically, everyone I see who has a fracture is intact. 
every now and then if there is someone that is not intact then we're suspecting that there may be a bony fragment or something in the canal that's compromising the neural tissue. So how is a compression fracture diagnosed? So immediately when someone comes in with pain to my clinic that has, that we're suspicious of a fracture, they have tenors right in that middle where, and it's really isolated, um, I'm gonna get an x-ray. I wanna actually see, do they, are, is it more muscular? Is there a fracture? Is there any sort of shifting of bones? You know, I, wa I wanna get an idea and get a picture of what's actually going on inside of them. So an x-ray is always the first line. Once I get it, and that's what you see in picture one, that's, a, that's an x-ray of a, a spine. And you can see there is a compression deformity or compression fracture. Now what I can't tell on an x-ray is, is this a new fracture or is this an old fracture? Now typically if they have pain right over that site, usually it's more of a recent fracture and the history they come with also really helps me diagnose that, that part of it. The next step is to um, see how bad it is. Now if it's really mild, mild to moderate, you know, we may try some conservative measures, but if it's severe enough, it's really affecting the function, now I'm gonna start uh, looking at getting more advanced imaging. Uh, for most of my patients, I'll end up getting an MRI as long as they, they are able to, or they're a candidate for it. Now that really helps determine if this is an acute or subacute versus chronic fracture, and I'm sure a lot of people don't understand what that means. Acute means something that happened very recently, there's, there's swelling with it, Subacute means there's some areas, there's still swelling, but there's areas of healing as well. So you're seeing a mixed picture, and chronic is when it's healed and now there's no swelling within the fracture site. So an MRI is one of the gold, is the gold standard for assessing whether it is a new versus old fracture. Now if I'm not able to get an MRI, then we may aim for a CAT scan or a bone scan. A CAT scan will many times can tell me if there is a fracture, it's a fracture intact, you know, it, it shows the bony structures very well, shows the fracture line, and, and, many, and we sometimes can assess whether it is a new versus old fracture uh, just based on how it looks on the CAT scan. Uh, bone scan, and sorry, I forgot to tell you, um, picture two is the MRI, and picture three is actually the, uh, uh, I apologize, picture two is the CAT scan, and picture three is the MRI. So, um, picture four, what we're looking at is the actual bone scan. Now, if, if, if I can't send them for the MRI, the bone scan may be my next step as well. Uh, a bone scan has markers that it's looking for to help differentiate whether it's a healed fracture versus a non-healed fracture. So if you look at the black area that's in the uh, middle um, of, the, of picture four where the vertebral body is located, the bone is located, you can see it's highlighting it black. That's the fracture site. It's actually a, a non-healed fracture. I can't determine age, whether it's recent or is, it, or is there some healing going on in there, but I, but I am able to see if there's a, uh, um, a see if it is an old versus new fracture. Uh, and that can correlate with the CAT scan as well, which we see on the uh, right side of picture four. Um, it won't be able to assess any sort of soft tissue or, or any spinal canal issues. That, that we really need to get a CAT scan or MRI. So what are the options to treat a fracture? Um, first step for most of my patients who do have mild to moderate pain is we'll, we'll talk about conservative measures. Usually we'll put them on, we'll talk about bed rest, you know, activity modifications, we talk about medications, and that could be from non-opioids or opioids, narcotics. Um, orthotics are something we'll talk about in a moment in physical therapy. There are some risks to doing this type of management as well. Um, when we give any sort of pharmacotherapy, pharmacological therapy, um, there are risks of side effects. There could be risks of increased fall. Uh, you can have some confusion with that as well. Bed rest is probably one of the worst things to recommend sometimes, but we may, it may be unavoidable because of the severity of pain. Uh, but it can get you more deconditioned. You can end up having lung issues. You can develop ulcers. Um, and also, unfortunately, bed rest, and we talked about this earlier, is inactivity, remember, it increases bone loss. So we can, ha we can also see that as an uh, unfortunate complication. Um, another option, which is a little bit more invasive at this point, um, is something called vertebral body augmentation or a kyphoplasty. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit more in detail in a moment. Um, so there's, when we're doing a, a vertebral body augmentation, uh, it is done, we do use local anesthetic to numb the area, but oftentimes it is done with anesthesia, pretty much every time it's done with anesthesia. Um, it's not an anesthesia procedure where you're intubated for the majority of our patients, but it's something where they give you enough to sedate you so that you're, 
comfortable so you can get through the procedure um, and not and we don't have and we can get well and reduce the risk of complications as well. Um, <coughs> it's a percutaneous way to inject cement, uh, meaning it's done through a needle, so it's not surgical. Um, it's hel it helps in pain reduction, and we'll talk about that in a moment as well. And, um, and if we need a tissue biopsy for any reason, uh, for instance, if we're thinking someone has cancer that caused it, um, then we're able to obtain that at the same time. Um, spinal fusions is more invasive, uh, and we talked about some of the indications for that earlier, such as a chance fracture where it went through the entire uh, bone and went through the, through the front and the back portions. <coughs> or the burst fracture when it involved the front and back portion of the, uh, s the spinal bone as well. Um, these are, like I said, these are very invasive. Um, many times the population may not be suited for this because some, many of my patients that come in are in their 80s and they're just not the best conditioned to actually have surgery. They, you know, they have lung issues, they have heart issues. And if we look at the comorbidities on the side, uh, for those who do end up with with kyphoplasties, 30% of them have some sort of heart disease, 29% of them have COPD, 30% of them have cancer, 21% have diabetes, or, and 11% have pneumonia. So there are risk factors associated with anything more invasive um, that requires intubation, that requires significant anesthesia and a longer surgical procedure. But uh, like I said, in some, some fractures, it may be unavoidable. With compression fractures or compression deformities that are recent, you know, there, there are, we can do, always do the least invasive thing, which is conservative management or just cementing the bone. So we'll talk a little bit about conservative treatment. So bed rest, like I talked about, uh, can lead to deconditioning, uh, lung issues, the ulcers, accelerated bone loss. Um, we talked about activity modica modification, spoke about medications briefly as well. Medications involve anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxers, if they're having nerve pain, then we would put them on a, ner a ner nerve stabilizer like gabapentin or Lyrica or one of the others. Um, we can also look at orthotics and physical therapy, and I'm going to talk about those in the next slide, in the future slide. So other medications that we could use are uh, calcitonin. Calcitonin is the nasal spray that, um, that uh, we prescribe. Usually it's for approximately six-week duration. Uh, it's sprayed in one, no one side of the nose one day, then the other side the next day. Um, there has been research that's shown that it does help with pain reduction because it helps release some endorphins or increase endorphin levels that help fight pain. It also helps inhibit something called osteoclast function. And what is osteoclast? Osteoclasts are cells in our body that resor or reabsorb or that are taking the minerals away from the bone and removing it from the bone. Like, I mean, it's, it's trying to remove it from the body. There are another type of cells called osteoblasts, and think of it as they're blasting, pushing stuff in. It's not like a, an explosion, but it's pushing stuff into the bone. So um, uh, th with calcitonin, it's been, there's some literature showing that it actually helps reduce osteoclast activity so that we don't reabsorb the bone. Instead, we try to mineralize it more, more so we can try to improve um, the fracture site, hopefully a little bit faster. And, and, also, and I can't tell you if it really helps with the osteoporosis side. That one we may have to speak to the bone health clinic, but. Um, opiates, I did mention this earlier as well, and opiates do have their risk because they can lead to constipation, they can lead to confusion. Um, my older patients do have more side effects, especially if they never, never had opiates before. Many of them don't tolerate them very well. Um, and anti-inflammatories I touched on earlier. And one of the uh, disadvantages that we talked about um, some of the risk factors, um, meaning what patients have, um, and renal insufficiency is one of the issues where we would not be giving anyone anti-inflammatories. If they have congestive heart failure, we want to avoid anti-inflammatories. So. Um, so physical therapy. Uh, physical therapy is, is one of the key things I always prescribe in my clinic as well. Um, we want to get you mobilized faster. We want you to start moving around because the longer you're sedentary, the more likely you're going to lose bone mass, you're going to have other internal organ issues, you're going to get weaker, more deconditioned. So with early mobilization, there are a lot of benefits to helping you not just get past the pain because it, it also helps reduce some natural endorphins, but also to help prevent some of the other things that I was just mentioning. Um, with physical therapy, they're also going to teach you weight-bearing exercises, extension-based exercises, so we don't end up with that posture we, I was mentioning, that, that 
bent forward or kyphotic posture. Uh, weight bearing exercise also helps increase mineralization of the bone. So you get increased osteoclast. That was the, the activity where the cells in our body put more mineral back into the bone. So it helps, helps increase that production as well. And these are things that we should be doing as a lifelong thing as well to try to prevent osteoporosis. We should always be doing some weight bearing exercise. And I'm not talking about like weights like lifting dumbbells and things like that. Just, ra you know, just walking or doing some exercises with your own body weight. Bracing. So there's a lot of different types of braces on the market. And um, there's different braces for different types of fractures or different types of conditions. So on the left side, of the left side of your screen, you can see there's something called a Jort brace. We typically would prescribe this for patients who have a T11 to L1 fracture, meaning that's, that's right at the junction between middle and your lower back. There's a cruciform brace, that's the middle one, that's more for your, your mid back and also down to your upper part of your low back fractures in that area. There's a T also, which is what I see most of my patients come in with when they have a thoracic fracture, sometimes even a, a fracture is lower, lower down in the lumbar spine. It's what <laughs> everyone seems to get from when they go to the hospital and they have a fracture diagnosed. Um, and these, these can be uh, very uh, intrusive. They, they cover a huge portion of your thorax, of your, of your upper body and your lower body. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of people, when they come in, they're when I see them, I, you know, I tell them, okay, we can get you out of the brace, and they're very excited because it's, it's so uncomfortable to wear. Um, even the lumbosacral braces, which is the picture on the bottom, that's usually for the lower down fractures, more of the low back ones, um, sometimes for the junction as well, right in the, between the mid-back and the low back area. Like I was saying, so these braces, um, there's a lot of literature out there, there that says that you know, so there's some in support of it, but there's more that's saying, well, it's not absolutely necessary. You need to brace a, a patient who has a fracture. But now the fractures I'm talking about are only compression fractures, those wedge fractures. When we're looking at other fractures like that chance fracture or the uh, um, burst fracture, many of those will need to get braced um, to stabilize themselves before, um, uh, in or before any uh, surgical intervention is taken. So, um, but for the compression fractures, many times it's not absolutely necessary. So most of my patients that come in, who are in a brace from the hospital or from the urgent care, um, I'll, I'll usually clear them once I review the x-rays. Um, but if I see a need for them, then I will continue for X amount of time. And some people do wear for comfort. Now with bracing, just some things to be aware of, it is uncomfortable. Compliance is always not there because if it's that intrusive, it's hard to sleep in. It, it really interferes with your breathing. Um, it, it, it's hard to eat sometimes <laughs> because how restrictive it is. You know, people just don't want to wear it sometimes, uh, even though it may be necessary. So, so we, we would make that decision together and when I see you in clinic and is it absolutely necessary or not. Uh, and not, not just myself, whoever you see as a physician will be making that decision with you, whether it's a spine surgeon or a pain provider that, that deals with fractures. Um, it also leads to some atrophy of the muscles of the trunk just because you're not moving them as much as what you were before the fracture happened and before you wore this brace. So from here, I'm gonna focus more on, the chi on a procedure called a kyphoplasty. Um, this is typically done only for those who have a wedge fracture, wedge compression fracture. That was the first fracture I showed you again. Um, the procedure itself is done under a device called a fluoroscope. A fluoroscope is a basically an x-ray um, that goes on top or around the patient. You can see that on the picture on the right side just on in the middle. And that helps us guide the needle or the equipment um, down to the fracture site uh, to cement it. So we're gonna go to the next slide. And so this is the kyphopla kyphoplasty procedure. So the first step is the actually, n uh, we'll, once we line up the area, um, we'll start numbing you up. You are under anesthesia, so you will be sedated for this, but you're under you're, the first step is to numb you up. Once uh, we numb you up, or I numb you up, uh, I would um, make a little small incision. Um, it's very tiny, it's probably less than about half a centimeter big, just enough to get my, uh, my trocar, my, my needle into that area. Once I do that, I'm able to guide the needle all the way down to the spine, uh, and that goes to the area where the fracture is located. We're gonna go from the side right through the bone, and that's the back part of the bone. Um, we don't wanna go through any nerve tissue, we don't wanna go through the disc, we don't wanna go through the abdomen, because there's a lot of risks associated with that. 
So this, has got, this goes through the back where there's all we see is the soft tissue, the muscle, some ligaments back there, and we're going to go right through the bone. Once we uh, enter through the bone, uh, that trochar you can see is going right to the back, well, the, it's the front of the bone, but it's the back part of that front portion. Once that, that trochar is going to be my guide, so once it gets into that area, and you can see the fracture site on this, um, I'm going to put a drill in. A drill is something that's going to help me create a little cavity in the, in the fracture site just to make sure I have enough space there, make sure I can get something called a balloon into that area as well. Because a fracture can sometimes be irregular and, and, and putting a balloon in and it just doesn't go won't, won't work as well. So we want to make sure we have a straight line or a, a direct track to get that in there. Now the next step is to actually put a balloon in it, inflate it. Uh, once we inflate it, we're trying to get some of that height back. I can't say it comes back this much. This is, I mean, it's an animation, but we are really trying to bring some more of the height back so it can help with your posture. It can help reduce some of the strain on the muscles. It can help in a number of different ways. Um, but it's what you're seeing right here is the balloon being inflated. Once that balloon is inflated and, and everything looks good in terms of our position, we're going to deflate the balloon and pull the balloon out. Uh, and the balloon does have some contrast in there. The contrast as long as the balloon does not pop, and I've, it's been a long time since, since I've seen a balloon pop, that contrast is not left behind. We actually pull all the contrast out as well. Um, and then after that, we, uh, um, we put the, uh, the next needle in through that guide wire, through that inflated area, and the cement is put in gradually. Um, and we do that in phases because we, as the cement goes in, uh, typically when you think about cement, it hardens because of cooler air. This is a medical grade cement, so the way the cement hardens is with heat. So when our, bo our body's warmth, our body's heat will actually solidify the cement faster. And that'll uh, help stabilize the fracture site, um, so and it helps reduce pain. And so this is what it looks like. So, um, so the procedure itself takes approximately 30 to 45 minutes to complete. Um, if there's more than one level of fracture, um, it can take a little bit longer. It can take up to an hour, hour and a half, uh, depending on the physician, uh, their experience, and, um, uh, and how many fracture sites are, there are. So, um, m Insurance typically will only cover a max of three fractures in one sitting, though, unless things have changed. Uh, most patients feel pain relief within one to two days. I've had patients where I've cemented their, their, their fracture site, and they came in a wheelchair and they stood up as they were walking to their car, they felt, they felt amazing. They were like, they haven't been able to do that in weeks. Um, so, and I've had others that where it did take a few days for them to feel much better. Now, when we see them for follow-up, they still are having some pain back there. And many times it's from deconditioning because it, it really affected their muscles, made it weaker. They may have some contractures like we talked about with the hips. Um, you know, there, there's, they could have pain in other areas as well just because of what everything they went through and with some physical therapy most of the times that's also rectified and sometimes we look at other treatment options if necessary and now, now this is an outpatient procedure uh, it's done at, at core we do it at our uh, at our spine center um, and uh, when you come in and you're going to be there for probably about two to three hours, depending, and you go home the same day. Many times you're actually out even faster than that. But um, it is an outpatient procedure, and, um, and um, it's pretty effective. So we're going to go through some data as well. So what has research actually shown about pain relief after kyphoplasty? So there, these are several different studies out there. The blue line shows the pain reduction after a kyphoplasty. And the other, other graph, um, the um, yellowish or goldish line um, bar graph, um, that's if it's done with just medical management. So both of them do show that you have pain reduction. Uh, kyphoplasty was just showing there was greater reduction in pain than the medical management side of it is what we're seeing with most of these studies. Um, so will my pain, the quality of life and function improve after a kyphoplasty, after cementing this, the fracture site? Uh, so this is a different type of uh, graph. Anything that falls on the negative side of the graph means that there was no improvement in that area. Anything that falls on the positive side shows that there was clinical improvement when they looked at the studies. So when you look at pain, it did show that there was improvement there. When you look at quality of life, that's what QAL is. Um, 
th th there was improvement in that as well. And if you look at functioning, that showed the greatest amount of improvement uh, when it came to um, uh, ju just the, the ability to walk, move around, getting back to your regular activities, your routine. Uh, and people were able to get back to that much faster as well. So what are the complications? You know, what can actually hurt occur after a kyphoplasty? Most complications are, are usually associated because of the leakage of cement. And this can lead to increase in pain. It can lead to damage to nearby tissue. Nerve and vascular damage can also happen. There can be embolization. Embolization means the cement went into a blood vessel and embolized, meaning it moved to a different location. It could go to a different organ. It can travel. It can go to a blood vessel and, and restrict its flow. So. Uh, it's usually, most of it's due to cement leakage. Now to try to prevent this, what we do is before we inject the cement into the spine, we're looking at the consistency of it. We want to make sure it doesn't look very liquidy, but we, wa we don't want it hard enough that it's not going to get to the correct area either. So we, we make sure it's, it's, its thickness is appropriate before we actually inject the cement into the fracture site. And it is done in stages. So as we're injecting the cement, I'm, I'm taking pictures on a side view and a top-down view to make sure that it's staying within the bone. It's not going in near any vascular structures. I don't want to go near the near any muscles. I don't want going near any nerve tissue. I, I want to make sure it's not embolizing. Meaning, is it you know that that's, it comes back to vascular. I want to make sure it's not flowing through an, an, a, a vessel. So we're making I'm making sure that that's also happening. And whenever someone's doing kyphoplasty, we're all doing it in phases that way just to make sure it goes goes appropriately. There's also risk of infection, bleeding, and that's going to be there no matter with any procedure you have. Now, the chance of this occurring is less than 1% of any of these complications. It's, it's rare that we see these complications. So now, you have a spine fracture. What's your survival rate? You know, this is a question that we get asked many times as well. Now, if, you're, if you look at the non-surgical or non-operative or non um, procedure related. So we're just doing conservative management, medications, therapy, some bed rest. Um, there on the left side of this graph, you can see at one year, that's the blue, blue line or the blue graph, there, there's a 73.1% survival rate. At approximately three years, the survival rate drops to about 42%. So what means if you, this means that if you did, if you did no interventions, and I'm not saying everyone needs an intervention, by the way, but if you had no intervention, interventional treatment, even no treatment for the fracture or osteoporosis, meaning you did nothing, you just left it alone, then your chance of survival three years out with just conservative approaches is approximately 42%. Vertebroplasty I did not hit on, you know, I didn't talk about, but vertebroplasty is basically doing the same thing as the kyphoplasty, we just don't use a balloon. So we're not trying to open that space up, we're not trying to bring the bo vertebral body back to a normal height, but um, when you look at comparison between vertebroplasty versus kyphoplasty, which is the, the graph or the, the bars are all the way to the right, um, there's definitely a, a greater improvement with using a balloon than not using the balloon. So that's, so we typically will always use the balloon. It's, it's rare that we don't. Um, with vertebral augmentation or kyphoplasty, at one year, the survival rate is about approximately 85%. At, at three years, that's, uh, that gets to approximately 60% or 59.9%. So to conclude, you know, we talked about osteoporosis. Um, one of the key things with osteoporosis or osteopenia is that uh, you know, you, if you have it or if you haven't been screened for it, you really need to get a bone scan or a DEXA scan completed so you can see your risk factor for it. Um, I would suggest talking to your primary care physician or we have a bone health clinic at CORE as well uh, who can help assess for that or just talk to one of your doctors you're seeing here um, and many times we can order the bone scan and, and, and discuss the results. We may not, not all doctors may treat it, but we, may, we can refer you out to who does if within our, our facility or we can have you go back to your primary care. Um, but the most important thing to do is to treat is prevention. Prevention is key. If you could prevent yourself from developing a fracture, developing you know, osteoporosis and then subsequently a fracture, that's going to give you a much better quality of life. You're going to have a longer life. You're going to have less complications. Um, that, that's, I, always I always find that's the most important thing. Exercise, nutrition, all that stuff is important. Now, let's say you do end up with a fracture and you have to undergo a kyphoplasty. So who, you know, who do we consider that for? Uh, 
So if you have mild to moderate pain, if it's tolerable, I really would go on the side of doing conservative management, you know, medications, maybe some rest, um, physical therapy, definitely, um, early mobilization with that, correct. Um, you know, do all the conservative things. Bracing, again, it's very dependent on what the patient is presenting with. We may, we may not. Most of the times, I, if it's a compression fracture or wedge fracture, I won't, but uh, unless I see there's some instability there. Um, so with mild to moderate pain cons and it's tolerable, we always opt for conservative. Now, if it's severe pain, it's really disabling. You can't function. You're, you're, you, it, it's just unbearable. You're in a wheelchair. You know, there's, or you're, you're your quality of life has just dropped drastically. Uh, then at that point, we're looking at, a, at, looking at possibly doing a kyphoplasty. Um, and just to get your, we want to improve your quality of life, your functioning as fast as possible so that we don't have, you don't become a statistic um, that we talked about with, with how, what, well, with what quality of life looks like, but also the death rate and those things, your survival rate. Um, surgery. Surgery may be recommended over kyphoplasty, but again, that's because if there's instability, if it involves, when I say posterior, if it involves the back elements of the spine um, with a burst and chance fracture, many times it does, and so that, that's when we're looking at surgical referral. Um, if there's fragments from the canal, it's causing neurologic changes, you have bowel bladder issues, you have numbness tingling, you have weakness, you know, then we're looking at more instability there and there, that may become more surgical at that point. So. Again, I emphasize, you know, the most important thing to do um, is if you're at that age where you should be screened, get screened, you know, they, you should um, really, if, from if you're young and you're listening to this, start treating, you know, proper nutrition, exercise, even if you're older, you should still be doing that as well. But if you're, like I said, get, get proper screening and if you have osteopenia or osteoporosis, start appropriate treatment so we can avoid any fracture so that we don't have to go through this whole process. So, um, these are my references, and I want to thank you all for joining. Um, and if there's any questions, I'll take those now. So everyone that I've seen in my clinic, when they have a compression fracture, it's happened suddenly. I've had a patient who was just getting off the toilet and all of a sudden she heard a snap in her back and severe pain. I've had a, I recently saw a patient who, who went sailing with her kids and the water was so choppy uh, that she started seeing, feeling pain in her back and it, uh, um, and she thought that could, could get through it okay and all of a sudden the pain started progressively worsening and I end ended up seeing that individual recently uh, in clinic. Um, usually compression fractures will happen suddenly uh, they don't happen over time. What happens over time is really that loss of mineralization that leads to the fracture. Typically, we do not do that. When I say typically, I've never done that. Uh, once that area is, is, is fused with the cement, uh, we're not going to be able to put another needle in there. If you do end up fracturing that bone again, I mean, the, the cement is in there to help stabilize it, and then hopefully um, um, you got treatment through uh, to for the osteoporosis or osteopenia so we could prevent this from happening again. Um, but I usually don't see a patient come in with a fracture at the same level or the same location. Now, if it were to happen, at that point, it likely would become a, more of a surgical case uh, because then you have to start stabilizing the levels above and below. And, and many times surgery is very dependent also on how brittle their bones are and, and if if your osteoporosis is just very bad, the surgeons may not be even able to do anything. We may just have to manage you as best we can conservatively. Um, and the reason why I say that is because if they're going to go do anything surgical, they want to make sure if they're putting hardware in, the hardware doesn't become loose. They need to make sure it's going to take well. So again, for uh, usually uh, when I do see a fracture again, and when I see a patient come back with another fracture, it's not at the location where the kyphoplasty was done, it's usually an adjacent level, it's level above it or level below it, or maybe a few levels even higher. Usually no, uh, because remember, when you have a fracture in your back, the, uh, fractures, the fracture site is very tender. So when I'm pushing right over the bone, which is fractured, 
that is extremely sore or extremely tender. With sciatica pain, we typically see, or, or reticulopathy, reticulitis, the other words for it, um, it, what we see is pain that's not necessarily just in the middle, but it's off to the side. It's actually going down to the buttocks, into your thigh, leg, depending on the nerve distribution. Um, so you, can you have sciatic pain with a fracture? Yes, that's possible, especially if the bony fragments are going into the canal and it's compressing the nerve. So that can happen together, but you won't, you necessarily, do, it doesn't mean that sciatic pain, that if you have a fracture, you'll have sciatic pain. And then this looks like our last question of the night. Are there any lifestyle limitations to having a kyphoplasty procedure? No, not, there are no lifestyle limitations. Um, if you do end up going through that procedure, um, the, the, the advantage, and uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, is that it actually improves your quiet life, improves your pain, your functioning is actually what improves the most, is what we saw in the data. Um, it, it can improve some of your posture, uh, and I've seen that with my patients as well, especially the ones who have mid-back fractures. You know, they're, they come in and they're, so they're bent forward. I mean, it's a significant amount. All of a sudden, when you do the kyphoplasty, you know, they may still have a little bit of curvature there, a little bit of a hump, but now they're able to stand up straight. I had a patient who couldn't even lift her head up, and once we were done with that, she actually was able to lift her head up, and she was, she was more stable uh, at that point. So it can help you out. Um, it's not going to restrict you, but you may be able to um, do more. Now, some of my patients will... Unfortunately, they, they, they're fearful that they may have another fracture and they may be restricting themselves, but that's not always necessary either, as long as you're going through appropriate treatment to try to prevent fractures.